Hi, everybody. Welcome to Mormonish. I'm Rebecca. And I'm Landon. And we have a very interesting episode today, don't we, Landon? We do. Viva Las Vegas. <laughs> Viva Las Vegas. Now, you guys are used to our podcasts about the um, Heber Valley Temple and also the Cody, Wyoming Temple and the work that we've done with the residents there as they're trying to get the church to adhere to the zoning codes and all the different community standards, height and all the requirements. Well, as the title of the thumbnail says, um, here we go again, right? Another temple with very similar circumstances. And we have been talking to the residents in Las Vegas and we're going to bring all this to you. It is actually really, really interesting, isn't it? Yeah, I, I would say of the three, this one uh, seems pretty egregious. Uh, I'm, yeah. I'm sure everything that we're going to talk about is probably legal. Uh, we probably ought to say that right up front. Right. However, it seems highly unethical yep. <laughs> if what appears to be going on is what's yeah. really going on. Yeah. And I will say that uh, this group in Las Vegas, they seem to sort of have the receipts. You know what I mean? Like they, they do. Seem, they seem to have found some interesting um, developments. So, all right, enough teasers. We will dive right in and we'll let you guys know what's going on. We're going to start by reading an article. Um, this appeared on, I think it was Channel 8. Is that what it was? The news. I think and Channel that's... 8, local news yeah. for yeah. Las local Vegas. News. Yeah, I think so too. So we'll just kind of go through this and then we'll dive into some of the other things that we've kind of found out with our interactions with this citizens group. So, um, the article says Northwest Las Vegas neighbors say LDS Temple would stick out like a sore thumb. This is an article written by James Schaefer, and it was posted last week, March 21st. Um, the other sub headline is church president says the location is essential. And then it says members of the Northwest Rural Preservation Association oppose the LDS structure because of its, this will sound familiar, size, height, and the traffic it would bring to their neighborhood near Grand Drive and Lone Mountain Road. So that's the headline. Let's go to our first slide. And you yeah, I, I, I just have to kind of laugh at this because only in Las Vegas can you get, uh, I mean, if you light up a temple in Las Vegas and people complain, <laughs> yeah, there's you're just plenty of places you could go to <laughs> in Las Vegas to light something up, uh, but they, they found a neighborhood that they could that's park right. it in uh, that they could cause a problem in. So That's only right. the church is, is able to do that. And why they consistently keep putting these huge buildings in the middle of neighborhoods, I, I just don't yeah. understand. I don't either. There are plenty of places where I believe it would be welcomed and pass through zoning and city councils and zoning boards with no problem. So I don't know why we're talking about three temples, but here we are. All right, go ahead, Landon. Okay, this is from the news article. There are no street lights, sidewalks, or traffic jams on TP Lane, and neighbors say they want to keep it that way. Twelve residents and members of the Northwest Rural Preservation Association, a group dedicated to protecting and preserving the rural, rural culture and lifestyle of the Lone Mountain area, said they have no problem with members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Just the building. I yeah. think we've heard this in yeah. every community yeah. saying... It's the building. You got to make it meet the codes. Uh, and that seems to be <laughs> what we see over and over again. Yeah, again. And in talking to these residents in Las Vegas, which we have, they echo that sentiment. They welcome a temple in their area. Just please don't change every code, every zoning ordinance. Please put it somewhere where it's appropriate. And again, that echoes what they say in Cody. That echoes what they say in Hebert. Uh, let's see, the height of the 240-foot tall spire of the 19.8-acre um, temple site is one of the many issues brought up by Brenton Mardson, a longtime resident in the community. We're talking about a three-story office building that's going to be lit up 24-7, he said. It's going to stick out like a sore thumb in the middle of a rural setting. And as you can see from the picture there, it is a very rural setting. Martson pointed out the temple structure breaches the existing code in the interlocal agreement between the city of Las Vegas and Clark County, created on January 2nd, 2002, as a long-term plan to protect the area from higher density urban planning. So much like the Heber Valley Temple, 
this is a situation where it's city and county kind of interwoven as far as their ordinance and, and codes, isn't it, Landon? That's exactly right. You can actually see the picture here of that temple lot, and you can see uh, that this is not what you think of as when you think of Las Vegas. It's a lot of single yeah. story homes. Uh, it's uh, in what they call the Northwest area mm -hmm. uh, of Las Vegas, and it's very rural. It's up against a mountain. Uh, and this is the place that people go to get away from the lights of downtown uh, <laughs> Las Vegas and the hassle and the traffic and all the things that happen downtown. This is where they go to live. Yeah. And as I said earlier in the article, this is so rural. They don't have sidewalks. They don't have curves. Yeah, I mean, it's very rustic. Um, I'll finish this last paragraph and then you can read the next page. Uh, for instance, back to the article, no home can be built on less than half an acre. Martson said, it has to be a single family home, no taller than two stories. And this is going to be 240 foot tall spire. I think that's taller than Heber Valley, isn't it? Um, I, or is it close? I think uh, that number is, I've seen the number of 214 as well. Yeah. So I, the, yeah. the news article says 240. I think I'm seeing 214 okay. in some of the other uh, locations. Okay. So it's over 200 feet tall. Uh, which puts that. it right in that same uh, in that same range. Uh, the thing to keep in mind here is is these are single level homes. Thirty five feet is the highest uh, roof line you can have in in this neighborhood, but most are single level homes, so only about twenty foot tall. So this thing is going to just dominate the skyline and dominate everybody. That's all you're going to be able to see is this uh, enormous building uh, sticking out. And that may be by design. <laughs> uh, Let's we, go to our next page. We, we've got to think at this point, so. <laughs> All right, you can read this, Landon. These are the specs on um, the temple. Okay, this is the Lone Mountain Temple. It was announced on 2nd of October, 2022. They announced uh, the site December 12th, 2022. Uh, rendering was released February 26, 2024. Uh, it sits on 19.8 acres. Uh, it's a single attached central tower. So this looks a lot like the Orem Temple or uh, the what, what's the one in uh, St. George, the desert? Uh, uh, the Red Cliffs Red that we Cliffs, toured. The Red yeah. Cliffs that we toured just a month ago. Yeah, or just a few it's, weeks ago, actually. 87,000 square feet. Yeah. So bigger than then uh, the one, uh, 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 it's probably about the same size as the Orem uh, and yeah. larger than the Heber Valley one. Yeah. Uh, it sits at 2,557 feet, and here they're saying spires 240 feet. Yeah, so I guess it really is. That is really hard to fathom, isn't it? <laughs> so um, let's continue with the article. Uh, Northwest RPA treasurer Erin Deloy said, she is concerned that their dark skies will disappear once the temple is lit at night. We have no streetlights, no curves, no gutters, and no sidewalks. And that's what we like, she said. This structure will be as tall as the Durango Casino, which I think is located not in the area, but like it's the next tallest building. Is that kind of how you understood it? That's the way I took it. Yeah. yeah. You can't see anything that tall in any of the pictures that we've seen. Yeah, exactly. In a moment of brief silence, Christian Salmon, a Lone Mountain resident, highlighted the absence of noise in the neighborhood amid the crowd assembled. So the news did talk to a group and for a moment they were quiet and you could just hear just, you know, nothing, that rural sound. Uh, they came here wanting us to change, but really it's already black and white, he said. All they need to do is follow the law. And how many times have we said that in all the podcasts that we do about Heber and Cody, follow the laws of the land and you'll be welcome. No one will say a word, follow the laws of the land. Well, I think there'll probably be some words said by some people that aren't going to appreciate <laughs> it. But if you're following the law and, you know, these people are saying, we intentionally made this area with no street lights, mm -hmm. no curbs and no gutters. Now you're going to be coming in, you're going to be putting a parking lot that has hundreds of lights. It's going to have 500 spaces. So it's going to have a, a ton of lighting and you're going to light this building up. We're out here where we're away from the lights of the city. They don't have official dark sky designation, but they've moved out. You know, they, they, they're keeping street lights out and other things. 
to keep it intentionally dark to enjoy the, the night sky uh, away from Vegas. So the residents set up how they wanted to live in this area. And then here comes the church. We're buying this 19 acres and now everybody has to change for us. Right. And they officially protected the area. And I think we'll get into that a little bit more, but they actually have yeah. an organization to protect the rural nature. And that is why people move there. They have a nonprofit. It's actually an organization that protects rural areas. So I think we'll get into that a little bit later. But And this existed long before the church came in. They, they have been activists when it comes to preserving this landscape. And we'll show all of the effort they went into to set this area up to be just this way right. uh, and how Legally. quickly how quickly all of that changed. Yep, agreed. You want to read this one, Landon? The neighborhood group strongly denied that any part of the concerns were about the religious affiliation of the building. If the Catholic Church wanted to build a basilica across the straight street, I'd be against that too, Marston said. This is not a religious thing at all. DeLoe gestured in agreement with the rest of the crowd, saying they have no ill will towards members of the LDS faith. I value their faith and what they have taught their people, she said. I don't want this to be taken as an affront to their belief, because that's not it at all. It's the building. The residents said they plan to speak at the Las Vegas City Council Planning Commission meeting on April 9th, where they plan to show their community signature of those who oppose the project. Well, I'm getting deja vu. <laughs> <laughs> Aren't you? I'm getting deja vu. And I know that the residents of Heber and Cody said the same thing. Please don't misunderstand this. We are not at all, you know, against in any way the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And unfortunately, uh, the people that we've interacted with have been attacked and accused of that. And that is not at all what is happening. But there have been multiple, you know, verbal attacks on them claiming that, that they're just out to get, you know, the LDS church. And that is not true. Yeah, that seems to be the playbook is mm -hmm. uh, to push back by saying, oh, you're religious bigots, when mm -hmm. all they're yeah. saying is, you're not obeying the, the, yeah. the building codes. You're breaking our building codes. You need to comply. But then they immediately get labeled as religious bigots. That's the playbook. That's the go-to that we've seen over and over in Cody, in Heber, uh, and now we're seeing it in Las Vegas. Yeah, it, it really is surprising, although not surprising, just how by the book this is happening. The words they're saying, the things that are happening, it, it's it's really sad to watch, I find. All right, let's continue with the rest of the article. Why this location? Bud Stoddard, stake president of the Las Vegas Lone Mountain Stake of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, said when he looks at the 19.8 acre site, he sees an opportunity for the community um, has more than 3,000 members have long wanted. Since 1989, members of the LDS faith have only had the Las Vegas Nevada temple in the foothills of Frenchman Mountain to attend worship and celebrate marriages. And this is a picture of that Las Vegas temple. And it has been there for a really long time. It is the only temple there. And I think we'll talk a little bit more about why they might be really motivated to build a, a temple in another area. But right now, the Las Vegas temple is there. Uh, we need a location that's close to members of the church, he said. The valley has grown over the last three year and a half decades. And for that reason, it has become more difficult for members such as myself who live all the way on the west side of town out by Lone Mountain to make it over. And I have been talking to people who live in Vegas who interact with members of the church in Vegas. And this is true. The Las Vegas temple is, they kind of described it in an area that may not be convenient to get to and may be, how can I say this? The area may have sort of changed since they built the temple there. Have you gotten that sense, Landon? That, that, that That's what I've heard now. The, yeah. the distance between these temples, we looked it up, is about 20 miles, 20, 35 yeah. minutes, yeah. Uh, 35 minute drive which to most all of us growing up, uh, right up until probably the last 10 years to have a temple within 35 minutes, uh, that was well yeah. within the expected uh, drive time for anyone to go to the temple here in Utah, let alone outside of yeah. Utah. So uh, when they say it's the only temple they have, uh, you know, I don't know what the usage is of the of the Nevada temp uh, of the Las Vegas temple. But yeah. one of the things we keep hearing over and over and over at the Heber Valley Temple is it'll bless the whole community when you yeah. put a temple in. So when you start saying, well, it's on a bad side of town or the 
the, the area around it's kind of dilapidated. Well, I thought the temple was supposed to make bless the whole community in that way. We keep hearing that over and over again. Yeah. But it seems like after, you know, uh, 20, 30 years, it's it's time to build a new one. It stops blessing you. <laughs> there, there's like a expiration date on the blessing the expiration right? date on the blessing that, yet? <laughs> that sounds <laughs> like it <laughs> well and i also because now suddenly i'm like talking to people in las vegas right we have one special friend who's there who's really doing a lot of research for us and you know who you are and uh you know it's interesting there are even rumors that there is another temple that's going to be built in vegas not too far in the future perhaps in the henderson area so that would be interesting to see too. Call us, and, but we we have kind of been trying to um, take the pulse of the temple attendance and staffing the temple in this Las Vegas temple, and we're still kind of digging into that. But from what we can tell, it's pretty much like every other temple. It's certainly not overflowing, certainly not so crowded that you can't get into a session, um, and also perhaps the idea that it might be hard to get people to work there. I think we hear this almost everywhere with every temple that they're facing these kinds of challenges. So, but we will find out more about that as we continue to podcast about the Lone Mountain Temple. So let's go to our next slide. All right. I think it's your turn to read. <laughs> Stoddard said the community of seven wards and congregation he's heard from in the area are tremendously excited about the possible temple. In my conversations with members of the church, this is the highest priority for them, he said. They love and are excited about the fact the temple has been announced for this area. If the temple is approved and built, Stoddard says, he looks forward to opening the doors and letting the community in before the building is dedicated. After dedication, only members of the church will be able to enter the temple. <laughs> building That's temples true. is essential for our religious beliefs, Stoddard said. What we do inside our temples is considered by us to be the most sacred, the most important types of religious worship that we can do. They prepare us for the next life. See, and, and like you mentioned before, we've heard this in Cody, we've heard this in Heber. I believe the LDS residents there know that there's harm being done and there are bad feelings and divisiveness in the community, but the overall sentiment there is just wait. It's going to be okay once you see the temple and it's here in the community, you'll understand, right? You'll understand how it's going to bless you. But as he said right here, we look forward to having everybody come in for a couple weeks and then it's closed to all of you. And in fact, closed to most members of the church. There's a low percentage that actually has a temple recommend and can attend. In fact, one of our friends in Heber in the citizens group, you know, she said, I, I figured this out. A temple is not a religious building. It should be zoned as a private club. It's only open to a very small segment of the population. So I do understand this idea that a temple is going to bless everyone in the community, but you really have to look at the other side of the coin. The people in the community are not feeling that. They're looking at their dark skies. They're looking at their traffic. They're looking at the impact on their everyday life. They're not able to go into the building. They don't understand. So blessing, I, I think maybe that word has different meanings to different people. What do you think, Landon? Yeah, I agree. And, you know, if, if you want to build a temple, that's great. Why do we insist, though, on continually to build these buildings in the middle of residential communities when there's perfectly good downtown areas that are zoned for these type of buildings, for buildings of these size that you can put the temple in? Uh, where people are expecting tall buildings and are expecting lots of traffic and are expecting all of these things, you'd have better. Uh, yeah, you. And, and look, uh, is there going to be public transport out to the temple to go there uh, when it's out in this rural area? No, but they can get downtown. They can get a bus to get downtown. They can catch trains downtown. But we, for some reason, the church keeps insisting that they have to be out in the middle of nowhere where they can be seen forever and and where they just destroy the feeling of community that a that a community is trying to establish. Yeah, I think about the Thailand temple, which we also had friends in Thailand that kind of kept us up to date about what was happening there and was telling us about the membership, you know, was so much lower than what they were reporting. But I have to say the Thailand temple... I thought was very impressive. It is in a downtown area. It's very tall. It's very lit up. It fits in with the with the cityscape. It actually 
looks really, really cool. And I'd actually like to visit there sometime. Our friend invited us. So we'll have to take them up on that sometime. But but that, it fit right in. No problem whatsoever. And I've seen the one in Philadelphia. It's right mm -hmm. downtown, uh, surrounded by buildings of a similar size. Uh, it doesn't stick out like a sore thumb. It blends in with the cityscape, just like Salt Lake mm -hmm. uh, does. Uh, but for some reason, the newer temples all have to uh, be be built yeah. in these. Uh, well, you know, I think about Red Cliffs, letters. right? The the Red Cliffs Temple, where, not this last time, but the time before when we were down there in St. George and we're driving around and we're like, oh, my gosh. Like, it's so huge. Like, you, you can't not see it from almost every street and every corner, everywhere you are. It's just it dominates, absolutely dominates that, you know, gorgeous red rock landscape. And, and what you have to understand is when you're not that religion and somebody builds something that is set up to dominate your skyline, it's basically them saying, we're dominating you. We, this building is here as a reminder to you uh, of our religious beliefs. And you may say, well, that's not my religious beliefs. Uh, you're welcome to, to be here, but you should be following the same codes every other church around exactly. me is following. Well, and I hear quite often, well, every landowner has to, the right to build what they want to build. You know, I mean, that's the sentiment. But then also every landowner has the right to expect that the codes and the zoning ordinances where they have built will remain so that their property is protected, their property values are protected. I mean, it kind of goes both ways. Yeah, absolutely. And people say, well, it, it increases your, your property value to live yeah. next to a temple. <laughs> and that just doesn't necessarily play out everywhere. Some places it does, yeah. uh, where you have a high uh, level of members who uh, want to live by a temple, and Utah most certainly does. But everywhere else, I don't think that's necessarily true. Mm -mm. Uh, and property taxes, think about that. Yeah, that's well, a problem. You, and and if it yes exactly if it does have a higher value or it does add a value the house that you just bought if it goes yeah. up a hundred two hundred thousand dollars in value and you intended to live there for twenty or thirty years that's twenty or thirty years yeah. of higher property taxes that you're paying now how is that a blessing to you they say it blesses the whole community but the church pays no taxes on that nineteen acres that houses their church and and, and we should say that they're not only building a temple on this mm -hmm. 19 acres they're also building a stake center yeah so you're talking seven days a week this is going to have traffic and cars and and things affected uh, by these this new buildings or these two new buildings uh and so as a neighbors you have a right to say we set up the codes to protect our interests mm -hmm. and now you're coming in and building something that breaks all of our codes mm -hmm. And the church wonders why they have enemies. I've never heard of yeah. a church that has enemies. Yeah. Uh, you know, no church I know talks about their enemies like the LDS church does. And to them, enemies is anyone who complains about anything that they're doing becomes their enemy. And I'm sure they're going to say that the people who are trying to stand up for what's right here, trying to stand up for their neighborhood, that they are their enemies at this point. And they could they could care less if you want to go worship in a building as long as you build it to the codes of the neighborhood. Yeah, follow the laws of the land. I don't know how many times I can say that. All right, let's go to our next part of the article. All right, um, 8 News now asked Stoddard, and again, that's the state president, for a response to the concerns of residents and Northwest RPA members about the temple's height and footprint. Those are great questions, and they're above my pay grade, he said. I just don't have a say about the overall size of the temple. Stoddard said he believes the temple is not a terrible thing for the community, looking to preserve a peaceful environment. This area is a 20-acre site, and it is going to be used for something, he said. Compared to other things that could be built on that site, this project is a hole-in-one. It's going to be tranquil, peaceful, and built to the, and I had to highlight this, highest possible, I think this has got to be some kind of pun, standards. Okay, so that's very interesting. I live next to a temple, and there was no problem having it go in. It was in a residential area, but it was completely zoned for that. It's on a corner with a stoplight. Um, there are accidents there. Quite often I've seen them because people are looking up at the temple. People are rushing to get to the temple. It's a hive of activity on that corner 
all the time. So I don't know about peaceful and tranquil. And he also mentioned compared to other things that could be built on this site, this project is, well, the other things that could be built on the site would be inher adhering to the zones and the codes that exist. So the other things built would be appropriate for that area because those things are not going into the city and trying to get everything changed. Yeah, it's uh, it's funny that he says highest possible standards. Yeah. <laughs> yes, it's it's going to be eight times higher than the possible standard for anybody else. And right now, this area is is uh, zoned for residential, which means the other things that can go in there are residences that are no more than thirty five feet tall. Now, how is that going to be uh, not peaceful, not tranquil? But instead, you've got a temple that has 500, over 500 parking spaces in it. And you've got uh, a stake center there. Seven days a week, this yeah. is going to be traffic going back and forth with at least, you know, several thousand cars a day uh, would be going through this. But somehow that's tranquil and peaceful. Yeah. I agree with him. It's probably tranquil and peaceful once you're inside the gates that are going to be around the building to block everybody else off from going in. Uh, that if you're inside the gates, it will be tranquil and, and peaceful, but outside it's going to be uh, more traffic yeah. uh, and extended periods of time, and it's going to be uh, lit up uh, during the night uh, yeah. and, and uh, be apparent from everywhere. Yeah, it's going to be basically the opposite of everything the formal nonprofit organization there is was created to preserve yeah. and that everyone moved there for that and organized to protect that. And it's going to be the opposite of everything that, that they're there to protect. So I like my AI, don't you there, Landon? Yes. <laughs> the giant tower. Yeah, I thought that was good. So, okay. Um, just in case we were wondering a little bit more about the makeup of the demographic of the LDS population um, in Las Vegas, I pulled something out of an article called Bright Lights in the Desert, How Latter-day Saints Have Shaped Las Vegas. Um, do you want to read that really quickly? It's just a little paragraph here. Yeah, church members now number over 100,000 in the Vegas metropolitan region. Though they represent only about 6% of the total population of Las Vegas and Nevada, members of the Church of Jesus Christ are among the most influential body of citizens in a metro community numbering over 2 million people, as well as throughout the entire state. The saints worship statewide in over 360 congregations with three missions and 34 family history centers, to enrich communities and help solidify family relationships. Yeah. So uh, 6%. six percent. Yeah. Six percent. And 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 we all know that that's based on record members. It's yeah. probably closer to about two percent that actually. I would guess maybe two point five you know. if you go along with the others. Yeah. yeah. So if you're two point two point five percent of the population of an area you should definitely take input for the major the wide majority of the rest of the people as far as what you do don't you think landon oh absolutely yeah that's that's yeah. what good neighbors uh, would do that's what good neighbors do that's right so now we're going to get into some of the details of what happened how this all happened some of this is technical we are going to explain it so everyone can understand so bear with us because by the end, you will have your mouth open going, what? <laughs> like Landon and I did, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Yep. As we as we talked to some of the people in the yeah. area that we were able to get information from, yeah. uh, we were just floored yep. uh, as we heard their story. So uh, let's start out by talking a little bit about the, the uh, temple lot and the temple parcel. Uh, this circled area right here is uh, the area where the temple is going to be. It is, uh, uh, there was actually kind of two parcels of land that they put together. Uh, they were both owned by the same person, though. Uh, the larger parcel of land is purchased by a private citizen's LLC from the BLM on September 12, 2018, for $2.8 million. This land is sold to the LDS Church on July 22, 2022, for $12.5 million. The smaller parcel of land, which was uh, like a two acre parcel, uh, was purchased by the same private citizens LLC from the BLM on February 28, 2022 for 735,000. It was sold to the LDS church July 22nd, 2022 
for also 735,000, which seems a little odd because this is a real estate company that was holding the uh, real, real estate. They certainly made a large profit on the larger uh, parcel, uh, but the, the smaller parcel, uh, they bought it in February and sold it to the church in July for exactly the same amount that they purchased it for. Uh, so it, it must have been part of some deal to to give them the acreage they wanted in order to get this uh, to, to make that profit on the larger land. But as you see there, you see the red X hashes. These these uh, hash marks, that is part of uh, the uh, the city and how they zone each area. So the red X hash marks represent one thing and the the uh, green X's uh, march another mark a, a different one. So this city is, th this is a uh, city, th this property is within city boundaries of Las Vegas, and therefore it's under the purview of this of the city council. However, it's surrounded by county land uh, uh, on the other side. So it, it, it goes right up against the county line. That becomes important because uh, things were happening in this area where the city would uh, not let county residents hook up to the sewer without annexing into the city first. And it became kind of a, a, a struggle between the two. So they set up some agreements between the county and the city, uh, which said what they which, what each entity could do and couldn't do that restricts some of the activities in this area. And we'll get into those in, in just a minute. Can you go so, back one? I just wanted to say one more yep. thing about that. So when we talk about the selling of the land and the buying of the land, um, there were several LLCs, um, I think three different ones involved in this, but they were all the LLCs of the same, you know, private individual. So, and I, I believe that individual is also going to be participating in development around the temple. Is that how you understood it, Landon? Yeah, he's definitely a real estate investor, and I think he owns uh, land around the temple as well. Uh, so he'll probably uh, benefit uh, from some of the other properties that uh, that are around or near it uh, during the development process, which is fine. He's a he's a oh, private business. Yeah, he pays taxes. Yep. He has to, you know, he's he's making a living, so he's doing what uh, what he does, but. Uh, what happened here is is, is a little bit uh, disheartening. Uh, as a citizen of a community, it, it is, to me, just heartbreaking that this kind of stuff can happen like this with so little say from the residents when you think you're protected. Um, this uh, area, and here's, here's the plat map, and you can see up uh, on the uh, upper right, there's a legend there, and the red X says you can't probably can't read that because it's a little small, it says that it's zoned residential A2. So it's this is zoned as a residential area and it's within a designated rural preservation neighborhood, yeah, meaning that cool. there were specific rules made for this neighborhood as to what you could and can't do uh, in development of this area. Yep. So the the parcel, and you can see right here, uh, there's there's a sign in the neighborhood that yeah. says Lone Mountain Rural Preservation Neighborhood. Yeah, it's like this, a historic site. It's a certain parameters preserve the area so that only certain things can happen in it. So yeah, you it's can official. Only... It's not just some neighbors that said, let's put this sign up. This is an organization. This is a designation, the Rural Preservation Neighborhood. Yeah, and, and the parcel lies within the boundaries of this. So what were the rules of this? You know, if you say it's a rural preservation neighborhood, obviously they're trying to keep it rural. That's the definition of rural preservation. So what they do to keep it rural is they say you can't build anything taller than 35 feet. You, uh, you're you limited on curbs, sidewalks, and street lights allowed. And we've been told that during a lot of the uh, city meetings, whenever a developer comes in and talks about streetlights, he's immediately shut down. And you can see from pictures of the neighborhood, there are no streetlights in this area. They're intentionally keeping it dark and, and not well lit so that they can appreciate the, the this darkness of the sky outside of the city of Vegas. I'm sure you can see the glow of Vegas in the distance, but for them, they want to keep this area where they live uh, pristine and rural and natural. Right. And I would uh, also say that lighting, light pollution can affect animals. It 
it affects the ecosystem there. It affects, you know, your natural rhythms and it can really hurt animals and especially birds when you have these giant lit temples. It really has an effect that, that you probably wouldn't, you wouldn't believe. When I looked into it, I was really surprised. It can be extremely damaging to large numbers of animals and especially birds with that kind of light pollution. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the other thing, uh, the way that the, the code is currently written, of course, you know, when you have a neighborhood, you're going to have certain uh, needs. Uh, you're going to have schools. You're going to have fire departments. You're going to have religious facilities. Religious facilities are allowed within the rural community. However, they cannot be built on over five acres of land. And keep in mind, this is now 20 acres of religious facility that's going in here. Uh, so, so you're uh, talking about by that 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 last line back there. If you go back to the last slide, in a neighborhood, you could build a little neighborhood church. It's not going to be on a massive piece of land. It's just going to be a neighborhood church on a little parcel that fits in there with everything else there and adheres to all the other zoning codes and ordinances. Yeah, an LDS ward house could be built yeah. in this neighborhood because it exactly. would fit on five acres uh, mm -hmm. with the parking and with the, yeah. uh, but again, you have to adhere to the, you, you can't have street lights uh, and you, you're going to, the church can't be over 35 feet. And usually they don't count the little steeple as part of the rooftop if it's right. just one of those fiberglass steeples we see on all the modern LDS temple or churches. Those don't those don't count towards the steeple. That doesn't count just the just the uh, rooftop and the roof line count. So yeah. those churches can be built in these areas. There's rules. There's regulations on how if you're a religious organization you build within these areas. Um. So here's the problem is it's a residential area. So they have to stick with residential codes. So now the temple, they just bought this 20 acre land. It's in a designated rural uh, setting. How do they build this enormous 240 foot tall to, uh, temple in this residentially zoned rural area? Well, uh, one thing that allows you to build uh a building that doesn't adhere to the code is it is if they set up what's called a civil district or a CV. What a civil district does is it allows a public building of a larger size to be built, but a temple doesn't qualify for this. The intended structure for this parcel does not fit civic zoning. The general public will not have access to the building. So Part of the rule to be part of a civil district is it's for civil buildings. Mm -hmm. If you want to build a community center, if you're going to build a fire department, if you're going to build a school, a secondary school, a primary school, public buildings that the public has access to, that is what is allowed in a civil district. And so that's the one get around here is you could build a, a building taller if you uh, are, are zone, in a zone that's zoned CV or civil district. But in the not light, a temple, it, not, not a temple, a temple. not At a temple, this because, time, not a temple, right. because a public people can. It, it's not open to the right. public. It's not a public building. Uh, also, you can't build a religious facility on over five acres. Right. So the church has a problem here. It's in an area it's not zoned for, and they're building this enormous building. They need to find a workaround. And as we all know, the church is proficient at at uh, finding a, a workaround. So what's the first thing that you got to do? Well, the first thing you have to do is you have to change the law regarding what's allowed in a CV district, because right now it's only allows public buildings that are open to the public. Hence, they find a solution. The solution is the city of Las Vegas bill 2024-8, introduced by the uh, council member from Ward 4, which Ward 4 happens to be the representative representing the area that the temple is going to go in. Her name is Frances Allen Polinsky. She introduces a, a bill to the city council to change the definition of a CV district. This is all done before the neighbors yeah. even have any clue uh, what this temple is going to look like, how large it is, how much space it's going to take up. They don't know any of this. This hasn't been announced yet. And it's she, not on their radar at all. It's, it's just happening they, in the city. They're probably not paying any attention. They have no idea that this 
possible change to a bill would impact them in any way. They really don't know. Yeah, and they think they're protected by their local yes. the the local laws that mm -hmm. say that you can't build anything that doesn't meet the code. Yep, they're sleeping tight at night, <laughs> not knowing that off in the city council, <laughs> there's a bill. <laughs> so this council member, Francis Allen Polensky, uh, worked and proposed a bill. Now, who wrote this bill and why is some of the questions that need to be answered. Right. One thing we do know is the bill was a, was signed off and approved to move to the voting process on February 15th, 2024, by the city deputy attorney. And it turns out that the city deputy attorney is LDS. We looked him up. He graduated from BYU, graduated from BYU, uh, I think, law school, law school, mm -hmm. law school at BYU. Uh, he's LDS. Now, that's not saying that he necessarily wrote it, but he's certainly aware of it because he's the one who approved it uh, to go on for approval by the city council. Right. So that means basically he looked at the bill and he goes, yep, it's all in order. Go ahead and vote on this city council. Exactly. And that's exactly what happened. Uh, the bill was approved by the city council with a vote six to zero with one person absent. And what we heard is the person was there. They just didn't show up for the vote. Uh, like they left the room for the They vote. left the room. Is what uh, during, we heard. And during I don't, the vote. Yeah. yeah. And nobody he knows why or and why, he, and then came back. why they didn't vote. So, right. uh, so anyway, this bill is approved by the city council 6-0 to rewrite the CV district. Now this doesn't set, you know, this this didn't set off any bells with the neighborhood committee. Right. Uh, this was passed just uh, recently, but it had already gone through and gone through the city council by the time they even learned about the temple being there. Uh, literally it was passed uh, within a week or two after they found right. out there was a temple going and, in and there. i'm sure they would never imagine it had anything to do with their area although somebody might go why are we changing this you know this code has been here for a very long time why suddenly are we changing this i mean if they would have been aware they might have asked that question yes and th this opened up so that you can now put in uh liquefied uh gas mm -hmm. places yeah. You can now uh, put in uh, cell phone towers. Uh, yeah. th there's a lot of different things that got added in into uh, into this bill. Yeah. It and reminds one... me of Heber. It reminds me of Heber, how the county changed everything across the board. And so now not only can the temple be built there, but any large lit up structure across the board, changing ordinances that had been in place for 20 years suddenly. And of course, it appears it looks like someone's doing it just for one certain, you know, developer, which would be the LDS temple. And I wonder if this sort of is starting to look like that here. I think we might dig into that a little bit. Yeah. So this is actually a, a portion of the uh, bill 2024-8 that was sponsored by uh, the Ward 4 Councilwoman uh, that redefined that civic zone. And, you know, before where it had to be a public building and it had to, you know, serve a public interest, they, ch they changed it completely. Um, and you can see here in paragraph number four, one of the things that they specifically said, uh, they said, when operated or controlled by a recognized religious fraternal veteran civic or service organization, the following, uh, the following uh, are permitted. Uses are permitted. Uses. Yeah. A, a church house of worship on a site of five acres or more, a school primary and a school secondary. That's exactly opposite of what it's always been, where a church, a religious building cannot be built on something that's over five acres. Exactly. You can see that they specifically changed the definition of a civic zone uh, so that uh, now uh, you, can, you can build inside a civic zone if you're a religious house of worship, and it can be over five acres. There's no limit on the size that you can do it. Now, keep in mind, this change doesn't affect, does not affect the area here because the area that the temple's sitting on is not zoned for civic, as a civic zone. Right. It's residential. It's zoned as a residential area. So this doesn't apply to that plot. Right. Which again is why I think the residents, even if they heard about this, they go, well, okay, whatever they did, that that's weird. 
we live in a residential zone. We're not CV weird, but doesn't really affect yeah. me. I don't think why any alarm we, bells would go off. Why would we fight this? Uh, yeah. The average citizen doesn't understand what's going on here, nor right. are they warned that uh, there might be a reason that this is being changed. Right. Now, no one's thinking per- of a big picture or even a plot. You kind of plan. have to have that mindset, some kind of plan set in motion, but you don't until hindsight. And then maybe you see it as all the pieces fall into place. Now, it's possible that they're changing this for other reasons, but the Mm -hmm. fact that the wording in here specifically says churches of worship on a site over five acres, I wonder how many other places are building on, you know, how many other church buildings are being built on over five acres uh, that this had to be changed for. So we're going to talk a little bit about why this might have gotten changed. Uh, But remember, it's still sitting in a residential area. Well, what's the second step that you have to do then if you want to build the church on this uh, acreage? Well, you have to rezone it from residential to CV. And that's exactly what the church asked to do. The church has put a motion out there on the agenda before the zoning board to get it rezoned. And that vote is scheduled to happen on April 9th. It's interesting to note that in order to get it changed, you first have to have a public meeting. The church, high, the church had this required public meeting on February 28, 2024, and they said it would be attended by too many people to be met at a civic, uh, so they held it at the stake center. And it was a meeting uh, to inform the residents in the proximity of the temple site. So if you were lived within a thousand feet of the temple site, you were notified about this uh, uh, rezoning request. The church's law firm, uh, Camp, uh, I'm not sure how to say Camper. this. Camp for Crowell led the meeting. The church leaders were in attendance. So the church leaders sat there while the lawyers from Camp for Crowell got up and told what the plan was. They showed pictures of the temple, what it was going to be, the size it was going to be. This is really the first time that the citizens know, oh my gosh, this thing is a monster that's going in our backyard. Okay, this is on February 28th. I believe that the bill that got passed to redesignate the CV was passed. Remember, it was approved on February 15th. So it was approved two weeks before this meeting. And it was approved like uh, March 20th. Uh, So just a couple of weeks after this meeting, it was approved. Before the citizens had even had a chance to gather together and figure out what's going on. And 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 so if I understand it, what's in place while they're sitting there at this meeting, my AI generated meeting is already the CV has been changed so that a religious building can be built on over five acres and there's wheels in motion so that their area right there is going to be rezoned from residential to CV with that new you know, that new um, ordinance there that a religious building can be built. So all that is there in place or in play or has already happened as they're sitting there at the meeting. With the vote on April 9th, which, you know, February 28th to April 9th is what, five, six weeks? Right. They have five to six weeks to organize Mm -hmm. and to try to figure out how to stop this uh, from happening. That's all the time they're given. Whereas the church, if you remember, they 2022 is when they announced yeah. this thing. They bought the property in 2022. Um, they've had all this time to get the ball in motion, to get these things written, to coordinate with city members, to, to coordinate with people inside city council. Uh, and we're going to see exactly what they did. And here in yellow, you're going to see the name of the law firm that represents the church, yeah. uh, came for Crowell. This is who represented him at the meeting, and we're going to see more about them. And let me say one thing about what you talked about, the speed. It really is a rapid fire scenario. I don't want to use the word attack, but in Heber and in Cody, we saw the same thing where it was just so quickly um, announced and everything was already in place behind it before the announcement. And in both Heber and Cody, um, they were able to mobilize very quickly. But I do imagine had they had more of a heads up, you know, they could have done more due diligence, but it leaves the citizens absolutely scrambling 
as they trying to find out what happened, what laws were passed, what bills were pushed through that they weren't even paying attention to because why would they without realizing what was happening? And this is the same scenario here in Lone Mountain with the Lone Mountain Temple. However, in this case, the residents already had that group, that rural neighborhood preservation group. And so although that group is not officially um, trying to you know, make changes here, members of that group were able to come together and kind of form you know, a sub organization. And, and they're the ones that are, are trying to make a change here. So, but again, blindsided almost is what I would say. Would you call it that almost, Landon? Yeah, absolutely. Um, how are you supposed to prepare for this? How are you supposed right. to defend yourself against this when uh, when the landowner has all the time in the world to prepare this and he only has to drop it in front of you? And you, you're talking about a billion dollar corporation with yeah. multiple law firms that they're uh, with people who are zoning planning experts. And you're a little neighborhood group that has no money, no lawyers. Uh, not even having meetings, and, and you all of a sudden have to go from zero to to a thousand miles an hour in in one to two weeks. It, it's really an uphill battle for these small communities, uh, and the church plans on that and expects so. it. They don't want any opposition. They know they're going into an area that they uh, are breaking the zoning laws on, and so what do they do? They do an end round around everybody who just set up their community for the last however long it took them to get this uh, rural district in place, they do an end run around them and then move in with and, and destroy everything that they've just uh, built. And they wonder why people are upset and why this is yeah. divisive. This is a model of the Lone Mountain Nevada Temple that was put together by a, um, uh, a person who actually does this for uh, different counties and, and that. Yeah, for and a you living, can, as we were For a living, about. yep. And you can see how much larger, uh, how much taller this is than all the houses that are around it. You can see the ones in the distance there and the ones in the foreground. Uh, you know, those are literally uh, less than 30 feet tall and the temple's 240 feet tall. So you can see it's going to stick up. It's kind of on a hill, as you can see, raised up uh, where it can be seen uh, from all over. Uh, it, it's not hard to see that when that thing's lit up, you're going to be able to see it from every single place in the community. Uh, it's, it's actually making me crave birthday cake. It does look like why, a wedding cake, doesn't it? I feel it? like when we get done here, I love cake. I feel like we're <laughs> going to have to go find some cake. Cause it's I'm in. Me, <laughs> it's making me crave some, you know, buttercream frosting. And it, <laughs> it, it did. That's the first thing I said. That looks like a wedding cake. Yep. Here's a here's another shot from uh, you know miles away of what it'll yep. look like. But you can see from miles away, it's sitting up against the mountain. Uh, with nothing behind it, and it's sitting up higher than everything else, and so it will be seen. Uh, you can imagine when that's lit up at night, especially with no street lights and limited lighting on the housing, it's going to be the only thing you're going to see at night is going to be this giant white beacon uh, sitting up on the hill of your rural uh, rural. neighborhood <laughs> by design and again this slide which i think maybe belonged to back we just wanted to again express that these residents belonged to the rural preservation association and from that group some residents banded together and they're going to be um, activists sort of in this arena trying to solve this um issue with the temple. So, and in a sense, that's good because this group already existed. And so they were able to draw from those members. They already had that common goal and they are able to mobilize fairly quickly, I think. And, and they have to. <laughs> this group is not, let's make it very clear. This group is not fighting the temple. Oh no. Not They're not. fighting to preserve the codes yep. that they had worked so hard and spent years putting into place and getting yep. through the bureaucratic uh, process to get these designations. I'm sure they've spent years mm -hmm. getting these in place and they were just shocked when they found out that everything that they'd built up was gonna be torn down within a month uh, uh, due to well, this. It reminds me of you, Landon, kind of, because you just don't think about it. You live in a house and you think, oh, I live in a neighborhood, the codes are protecting me. I'm in a certain zone, nothing will happen. Well, what happened to you, Landon, suddenly out of the blue? Yeah, they put a freeway in my backyard. <laughs> there literally is a freeway in Landon's backyard. It was a nature preserve. It was absolutely beautiful. It was so peaceful. It was quiet. Yes, there were mosquitoes, but it was gorgeous. And all of a sudden, 
Yep, a freeway which I could a have freeway. I could have dealt with uh, the freeway had they put some sound walls or something up. But oh, you can uh, it see sounds, the cars. You can, you can see, see the, cars the cars, and you can hear them as you as you sit in your backyard uh, very loudly. So uh, yeah, it's you you know when you get that, and and there are things. There's times you can't there that you can't fight against it. You can't yeah. do anything about it. But in this case, you know, th these people put this in place. They expected that it was going to be in place, and they had a big reason to think of that. I told you that uh, the that the county and the city both uh, had had some issues, and so they put into place an intralocal agreement that's been in place since 2016. And when you go back and you read it, it was put in place in 2016, and it said that it is uh, valid for 10 years. And and then after 10 years, if there's no uh, if nobody does anything with it, it's in place for another five years. So this is in place till December of 2026, the interlocal agreement. And here's what the interlocal agreement says on joint land use planning for area A1 and A2. And remember, this is what the temple is sitting in. It says during the term of this agreement, the areas identified as planning area A1 and A2 must remain residential and designated at a density of no greater than two units per gross acre on the party's respective comprehensive plans. So it says right here, it must stay residential. You cannot change it. And yet what's happening April 9th, there's going to be a vote to change it from uh, this residential A2 to uh, CV, civic yeah. development. And I would say that I think the residents could not feel more secure with this and with all the other zoning and all of the other codes. Why would they ever think this would change? This is extremely clear, must remain residential. They were very secure in their area and that nothing would happen. And this may be a point that they can fight, but a citizens group of neighbors now has to raise how many tens of thousands of dollars yep. We've to seen fight it in this in the court yep. We've to seen keep it, it from happening. Yep. So the, the neighbors are, are just stunned. They're going, how in the world did this happen? How did this all change within one month? What mm -hmm. drove this change? Well, they did some research mm -hmm. and they presented a letter to Councilwoman Alan uh, Polensky, who is the person who introduced the bill to change the district, what the definition of the CV area and uh and then she's also on the board for hearing the you know the planning board will consider rezoning but then it has to be approved by the city council uh right. and this they is, shared this letter with us they shared and this letter this with is us why once we read the letter we knew that we had to look into it just a little farther <laughs> so this is the letter that we're going to read that they shared with us that they sent to the councilwoman who as Landon said, introduced that whole change to the CV. Okay. Um, do you want to read that? I'll read the first page and then you can and read, I'll the, read second the second because it's a long letter. That's right. So this is really important. Everybody listen up because this is why we were left going. <laughs> so it says, Dear Councilwoman Alan Polinsky, it has come to the attention of our group, and this is the citizens group that is formed, that Bill 202408 that you have sponsored appears to weaken the stringent requirements in the current CV zoning code. Furthermore, after a thorough review of the previously mentioned bill, it appears to be tailored to aid in the approval of the Lone Mountain Temple and separate meeting house development. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the developer, has used this same playbook all over the country to get their projects approved. Good for this group. Seriously, I just have to say that aside. Good for you for seeing this. Um, it is disappointing to see our community bow to this developer at the expense of an established rural neighborhood. With the developer, again, the developer is the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, requesting a zoning change from residential to CV for the Lone Mountain Temple and separate meeting house project at the upcoming April 9th Planning Commission meeting the timing of the introduction of the bill seems strange. With that in mind, will you please provide an explanation of why this bill was created, the timeline of when work on the bill 
um, on the bill was initiated, the name or names of the city of Las Vegas employees that have worked on this bill and the names of any outside persons that may have contributed to the creation of the bill. So they're asking for information. Where did this come from? Why was it suddenly here? Why was it passed through so quickly? Who worked on it? This is what they're asking. These are all legitimate questions that you can ask of your city council. Exactly. I think what they're looking for is, was the church in any way a yeah. participant in helping to write this bill or encouraging this bill right. uh, to be written uh, for the purpose of, of changing the, the, the zoning? Uh, so they could get their temple through. And as I said, it seems to aid in the approval of this temple. Everything that happened with the bill seems to be, oh, this is great. This exactly what perfectly you need for the temple. Yeah. To build this temple. They say also of note is the fact that you have accepted $10,000 in contribution from the law firm came for Crow. Now, do we remember that name? That's the law firm that was at the meeting representing the developer who is the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. So they're saying that the councilwoman who introduced the bill had received a $10,000 political contribution from the law firm that's representing the church. Uh, and, and that's what they're they're pointing out. Right. And again, this is that's not illegal at all. Anybody can give yes. anybody a campaign contribution. That's completely, completely legal. Absolutely. These donations occurred the same year the property was acquired by the developer, $2,500 on 614, $3,000 on 99, and $4,500 on 12 2 2022. Yeah, all of these were in 2022. That's correct. Along those same lines, it appears Councilman Knudsen, Councilwoman Seaman, Councilwoman Diaz, and Councilman Creer have all accepted contributions totaling $60,000 from the previously mentioned law firm. In total, the council has received $70,000 from this single law firm, 40,000 of that occurring either right before the land purchase or right after. And again, not illegal. Completely not illegal. illegal for a law firm to give members of a city council campaign contributions, completely yeah. legal. However, it would be illegal for a church to do so. Um, it a, would a, be illegal for a church to do so, but this is not the church. This is the law firm of the church in Vegas. It's representing the it's church. It's a distinction. That's right. Lastly, we respectfully request that you please investigate any potential conflicts of interest that could occur if any person working on the previously mentioned bill or any other matter regarding the previously mentioned development is aff uh, affiliated with the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Thank you for your time and attention to the matter. We look forward to your response at your earliest convenience, Preserve Rural Vegas. Hmm. So this was a bombshell when we when we read it because, um, uh, you know, you can say that these are allegations that, uh, that the city council took political contributions and all of a sudden uh, all the zoning changed uh, for yeah. this piece of property. Which could um, be a coincidence. Because campaign contributions are not illegal. It could be a coincidence. You you could make that <laughs> argument, but it sure looks highly suspicious when... I'm playing devil's advocate here. Yes, I understand. I mean. it, it, looks highly, it looks highly suspicious when the city council approves these changes 6-0. Uh, and basically what they've laid out here is five of the seven people on the city council receive contributions of at least... $10,000, which is the maximum, uh, I believe that's the maximum contribution that can be made uh, to a political uh, campaign. This is not something they just made up. Um, we were able, they, we asked, uh, we asked for and were able to get uh, a copy of the, everyone who's on the city council has to file uh, a list of who their donors were and when these donations were made and who they came from. Uh, we got them on all of these people, all of the council people. And you can see here, here is the Las Vegas City Council. They did receive a $10,000 contribution from the law firm representing the church, uh, came for Crow. Um, and as you can see, uh, here's a list of the council people and when they received those contributions. So. 
2023, two of the council members got $10,000. And in 2022, uh, three council members got $10,000 each, uh, with the council person from Ward 2, Seaman, getting two $10,000 contributions. Uh, the person who introduced the bill was Councilwoman uh, Alan Polensky. She received a $10,000 political donation in 2022 uh, from the church's law firm. And uh, in 2021, uh, Councilman uh, from Ward 5, Prayer, received $10,000 from the same law firm. Now, we don't know. The, the land wasn't purchased until 2022. Uh, so 2021, we don't know, uh, you know, if that would have had any political play with with this. Although when you're on a uh, political board and you've received a $10,000 contribution from somebody representing somebody, uh, it's highly motivating uh, for you to vote uh, the way that they have asked you to vote. Uh, we're uh, down here at the bottom, you can see this is an actual, we clipped this out of the report. We didn't want to show the whole report because there's one for every year for every council person. So there's literally 10 or 12 of these reports. Um, some of them are uh, five, six pages long each. So we just cut out one of the examples showing when the contribution was made from one of the uh, people. But uh, anyone can request this information for the Las Vegas City Council people to see where they're where they were getting their donations from. And you'll see this name over and over. The interesting thing about this as we scrolled through these reports was most contributions were 100, 200, 500, 3,000 was a large contribution. You're there talking about $100, $200. $100. We're not talking dollars. about thousands of dollars. Yes, okay. we're talking $100, $200, 3,000 would be a large donation. There were only a few of those. I think I saw one $5,000 donation Nobody except this law firm had made ten thousand dollar contributions to in one payment to anybody that we saw. Uh, I did see a casino that had given ten thousand uh, dollars to someone in groups of two five thousand mm -hmm. dollars. But this is by far the biggest donation any of these council people received, uh, and it all comes from the the law firm representing the the church. And they, you notice that in 2020, no contributions were given to any of these councilmen from this law firm. Yeah, that was my question. Did the law firm, you know, like in 2018 or 17, maybe it's just a regular thing that they do, but but you looked back and you hadn't seen any other contributions from that law firm? To well, we firm? only got them back to 2020, but okay, you can so see that in know. 2020, nobody got anything. Then okay. all of a sudden. Well, that was COVID. Nobody got anything. So we do not know. We do not know past or prior to 2020. Yes, but uh, then we see large donations from one law firm in particular going to the city council. Why does a law firm give $10,000 to a city council? I'll let you answer that. But uh, I think uh, that they're definitely expecting something for that $10,000. Uh, and I can't say that the city council voted for it based on this. But this brings up a lot of ethical questions. Should these board members be able to even vote on this when they've re received political contributions as a result? I'm guessing the answer is yes, because the church has an army of lawyers who make sure that everything is just inside the legal uh, envelope but right. this is a demonstration of why so many communities are so upset by these temples because they spend years putting the making their community the way they want it and putting the codes in place that they want. And we've seen it over and over and over again where the church comes in and they were able to overturn it in Cody by using, uh, they had a city planner that was LDS. They got someone on the board that was LDS. We see it in uh, Heber Valley, where Heber Valley, everybody was LDS, so they didn't have to do anything. They, everyone just bowed and, and, and voted exactly how the church told them. But then you go to Las Vegas, where nobody on the board is LDS. How do you get them to vote for your temple? I don't know. Is this a way that you get them to vote for your temple? 
I I don't know. I'm, well, it is interesting when we talked to the residents because they did explain that thought process that even led them to even look at this because they did think that. They thought, you know, is there influence? What what would that be? You know, are there people that are members of the church that might, of course, want to, you know, see the temple there? And that wasn't really the case. So then they thought, what what's another form of influence? And that's when they decided to just look back through some of the records. And, and it was very interesting what they found, whether it means what they think it means. We don't know. We can't say. We're just presenting this information. Exactly. And as I said, uh, we have seen all of these reports and they, it, they I think have you been, can just look them up, right? I mean, yep, you can just they have get them. They're these, public. Yeah. Th these are public records and they yeah. have been given, the, they have made the political contributions <clears throat> to, the, to these people. Yeah. So what happens next? <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I love this cartoon. I just have to describe it. If you're listening, I saw this on Reddit today. Somebody had posted it and written Heber Valley Temple, but it applies to Heber Valley, Cody. And now <laughs> it applies to Las Vegas. So um, for those of you that are listening, it's a series of igloos out in the snow. And there's one igloo that's like 30 times higher. You know, it's rounded on the top. And the Eskimos walking by say, beats me how they got it through council. <laughs> so that's exactly what we're talking about. A it's very extremely oversized igloo. You know, how did they get that through city council? I don't know. <laughs> So here's what's happening next. The Planning Commission will review the request to rezone from residential to CV on April 9, 2024. Our hope is, is that the Planning Commission is made aware of, of you know, these uh, donations and they know uh, and that the city, uh, that the people in the residential area that want to maintain the residential uh, uh, zoning uh, are able to uh, pulled together that quick and and provide a response and and yeah. stand up for the at least uh, speak zoning. at least be able to speak for their zoning and and their point of view you know instead of just having it all happen you know without anyone knowing at least let them be able to to share their point of view and, and we asked them we said how do people get on the planning uh, uh commission and uh Basically, it sounds like each city council person gets to appoint somebody to the planning uh, commission. So <laughs> these people kind of represent the person that's uh, that's been uh, assigned or who, who picked them to be on that. And as you remember, five of the seven of them have received uh, uh, large donations from uh, the, the law firm. Um because the CV requirements have already been changed by the passing of Bill 2024-8, if the zoning request passes, the church will only have to get a minor plan review of the project. This most likely would pass. So if, in, if on April 9th, if they change it to civil, from residential to civil, they don't get to build the temple automatically. They now have to submit, but they'll now submit a plan under a civil uh, zoning designation rather than a residential. And since the civil was just rewritten to allow them to do what they want, they are within code and they'll be able to uh, do exactly uh, what they plan to do. And it would just take a minor re uh, plan review because they're not asking for any special consideration. Without the changes, or if it doesn't approve, um, then the rezoning from resident, if, if the residential to see civil vote that's pending does not pass, the church would have to uh, go through what's called a major plan review and require a special use permit request, which most likely would not pass uh, in that case. So to them, getting these two zoning codes requirements changed is part of their playbook to make sure that this happens. Now, yeah. I'm going to stand back and I'm going to say right now, what everybody's going to say that uh, is in support of this is they're going to say, hey, we changed the law legally. We were, They went through the developing process that any uh, developer uh, that, that's knowledgeable in codes and stuff knows what you have to do to get it passed through. The problem is this big organization that has billions of dollars tax-free is running over what the local people want for their community and through influence and through people positioned in the right place they're they're writing the rules and just 
steamrolling the community. And that's why the communities are so divisive right now, is they're being steamrolled. They know they're being steamrolled. And when they stand up and say we're being steamrolled, all they hear is you're a religious bigot because you don't want us to come in and change everything you've worked for for the last 15 years because our religion is more important and you should know that you're going to benefit from it. And that's what we're seeing. And it's a shame to see it. Um, and, and you can say that's my opinion. But I think if you look through the facts here, how all this stuff just amazingly changed just as it needed to for the church to get the temple in this area that it wasn't zoned for. Uh, you make up your mind. Uh, we're, we're just presenting what we have uh, seen and what we found. Yeah. And, and I think, like you said, nothing illegal has happened. And I think it probably is par for the course in a lot of ways. Developments happen. We're not, we don't know a lot about that, but I think people might expect differently from a religious organization or a church. And unfortunately, this seems sort of to be business as usual. And I think that's where people get really disappointed and sad and mad. And, and then communities kind of fall apart, like we've seen in Heber and Cody. And we have seen that. We're not exaggerating when we say that community there in both places has really suffered, I think, irreparably as far as people moving out people never looking at their neighbors the same way again, because you're all of a sudden on two sides of this issue uh, where you used to be a community and it didn't need to happen. These temples could go in a place where they're zoned for, where they meet the codes and they would be welcomed. Uh, absolutely. In fact, we thought, why don't we come up with some ideas for what a Vegas temple would look like? I mean, we've done that for the other yeah, locations. We always do it. That's right. That we always say, let's let's match it to the environment. So our idea, of course, is to maybe build it closer to the strip where everything is already lit, right? And everything is already big and tall. So we, of course, put into AI, what did I say exactly? Something like temple on Las, uh, Mormon temple on Las Vegas strip. I think I said something like that. So uh, we can it, it came up with some great things, some casino signs. It's got the um, parking, valet parking in front. It's got the lighting. I like it. Don't you like Good. it, Landon? Does that one say girls, girls, girls? Uh, you know, AI. Well, that would have been really, an old time. That would have been yeah, back pre, pre. Yeah. AI can't write. So nothing is really spelled right. <laughs> they actually got casino right. But then in the other one, it's called Kaino. So Kaino. for some reason, AI gives you six or seven fingers <laughs> and it can't really spell. It's just off, you know, <laughs> which maybe is good because as we read last, what I covered on the newscast, the Mormon newscast last time, if you remember, it was all about the church's warning against AI because they're very concerned about deep fakes, meaning that the AI may be so good in making a likeness that you might think your church leader is doing or saying something, you know, that's not real. So maybe it's good that AI has hot dog fingers and seven of them. So I think we have two more, don't we? We do. Uh, yeah. yeah, here we go. Here we go. Casino. And again, the stairways and the lighting, they all still have the Angel Moroni, though. But again, wouldn't that fit right in on the strip? I feel I, like I wanted to see Evil Knievel jumping oh, uh, over okay. the temple. I'll I thought try that would to be make cool. that. I'll put it in the show notes. I don't think I'll be able to make that. So, but then we started to think, you know, it really would fit in on the strip, wouldn't it? I think it would. Oh, and then we started to brainstorm on some reasons for some things that were in common with the biggest strip and the temple, why it would be a perfect fit there. Didn't we land it? We did. Yep. Yeah, and we did. And we got inspired by um, Mormon news roundup because they always have their fabulous top 10. So we thought we can do that. So these are the top 10 reasons why it makes sense to relocate the temple to the Vegas strip. And we have some AI there, some fame, you know, Elvis and Donnie Osmond playboy bunny in front of the temple. So I'll read the first one and then we'll read through. So, um, why it makes sense to relocate the temple to the Las Vegas Strip. Um, what happens in the temple stays in the temple. So kind of the same slogan, right? Because we all know what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. So I think that's a great reason. They they literally have, they could share a billboard. It's the same slogan. Yeah. And uh, the second reason is because Elvis impersonators already have a white jumpsuit. That's exactly it. That, that's perfect. I love that. They can even trade off. I think that's great. I love that one. And I like that AI of the Elvis impersonator right there to the left. That looks really good. 
Um, let's see the third one. They both have mob ties. Okay. I can see that the history of the LDS church definitely has some mob interaction. And of course, Vegas, you know, the stereotype is the mob ties. I like that one. That's good. Yep. Number four, you have to pay to play. Ooh. If you don't pay up, something might happen to your family. That's true. You can't mess around in Vegas. If you play, you have got to pay if you owe. And that's the same way with the temple. You really aren't even getting in unless you can pay. So <laughs> I love that one. All right. The next one is, oh, they both specialize in quickie weddings. That's true because a lot of LDS kids meet and like a week later, they're engaged and a week and a half later, they're in the <laughs> temple. That's a quickie wedding, right? That's exactly right. Uh, and you have the wedding chapels on the strip that do the same thing. So well, there are a lot more similarities than I even imagined. This is this yeah, is you, cool. Mormon elopes. You could elope to Vegas yep. and, and yep. go right to the Vegas uh, temple. Yep, that's it. They both have mirrored ceilings. Uh, ceilings uh, with ceilings. ceilings. Yes. yes, they're spelled differently <laughs> for our listeners. Mirrored C-E-I-L-I-N-S, and that would be in Vegas. And mirrored ceilings, S-E-A-L-I-N-G-S, meaning when you get sealed, you're often told to look into the series of mirrors that help you see forever. So they both have mirrored ceilings. I like that one. That's a good one. Um, let's see. The next one is oh, you get to see a show. That is so true. You get to see a show both places. Vegas is known for their shows and so is the temple. So that's right. Boy, they're they're like hand in glove here. They're, they're the same place. This is amazing. OK. OK. Our next one is Satan makes an appearance in both uh, both locations. <laughs> yeah. We are always told that Satan is in Vegas. That's right. Don't go there. That was, you know, the big thing. Don't go to Vegas. Sin City, right? <laughs> That's right. That's right. That's funny. All right. Almost done here. Oh, lots of, lots of costume changes. That is true, especially in Vegas. There's all kinds of things going on, shows and costumes and costume changes in the temple, too. And last but not least, Donny Osmond performs uh, at both locations. Yeah, uh, at both so locations. You, you might you might there. meet him at the Vale uh, and then go see a show afterwards. Yeah, yeah, I knew someone that did meet him at the Vale. Like, you don't know who's on the other side and they're going through the whole thing and they go through and they're like, Donny Osmond? <laughs> <laughs> it was a celebrity moment at the Vale. I wonder if anyone else has had one of those. So. Anyway, of course, this is just lighthearted at the end. Um, but do you have any final thoughts, Landon, on this? It's obviously going to be an ongoing story. And now we're going to have to change our thumbnail. We always say a tale of two temples. We're now on to a tale of three temples. And I almost feel like I'm kind of, um, I'm watching the Bakersfield temple. I'm on a thread on Reddit with Bakersfield. And the people are saying this, hey, hey, they're trying to build this thing. It's got a tower that's twice um, what the code allows for in our city. Does anybody know about this or what the city council is doing? So I picked that up and I put a note and I said, call us and watch this video. <laughs> I kind of put in our last couple of videos. So, you know, it seems to be is happening there too, that there's a tower, it's trying to go into a neighborhood. And again, they're trying to change all of the zoning requirements. So maybe someday we'll have a thumbnail that says a tale of four temples, right? I don't Could know. Be. It seems Vegas, like Bill, call me. <laughs> Seems like the more uh, that we do this, the more people are, that call us yeah. with uh, these uh, things uh, that they're right. seeing and saying this this just isn't right. How do we how do we stop this? Nobody else comes in our town and does this to us. Yeah. Why is this happening over and over? Uh, and the good part I think is is that di different communities are starting to see the playbook. Uh, yeah. But likewise, I think the church. Uh, knows that and the church is going to do everything they can to keep this as quiet for as long as possible to give nobody a chance to review what they're doing and that that just isn't uh fair that citizen groups get just weeks to try to try to solve uh something as big of a problem as this because the church is working behind the scenes changing their codes changing everything uh, that they need to to get their building in, regardless of what you have spent years building up and, and putting in place. Right. And it is expensive um, to raise awareness. Yes. Like I think about what did they tell us? Uh, oh, even like yard signs and things like that. If you want to put signs in your yard, like I know Cody has relocate the temple, meaning to a more appropriate spot, um, you know, thousands of dollars just for signs or for flyers or maybe postcards to make people aware. So it definitely does take, um, and these are private citizens and using their own money, Heber, Cody, and now here, 
Lone Mountain. And we will have a link to their website in the show notes where you can contact the, the citizens group in Las Vegas if there's anything that you think that you could do to help. But I will say that across the board, all these groups that we've worked with, they all look around their towns and they go, look, the temple would be great over there, or it would be great over there, or there's a great area. Like they're not trying to not have a temple. They just know their area and they're looking around thinking it, we would welcome it over here. Every single group can point to areas. Haven't you seen this, Landon? Every yeah. single group can point to a place where there would be no pushback and it would be just fine and it would be welcomed and it would be a blessing to the community as you know the LDS uh, members are, are, are claiming that it would be. So it's sad to see that, that they can all look around and say, why can't you just build it here? Why? Yep, I agree. Uh, we we just need to, uh, if, if you don't want to have this divisiveness in communities and split communities apart, don't put them through this. Put it where it's already zoned for it. That's what they're telling you. They're saying, if you want to put something this large and this tall, here's where you put it. It doesn't matter where in there you put it. You're free to put it wherever you want in this area, but that's where buildings this size go. And that's what they're saying. Uh, but again, over and over, we're seeing where the church insists. And you saw the first article there. Uh, it, you know, it said the, the church president says it, it, the, it the location must, must be yeah. that location. It must be here. Why in the world does it have to be in that location in those people's neighborhood? Uh, Backyard. You yeah. can't worship anywhere else except in those people's neighborhood. That yeah. that just... Well, uh, they, Seems I think they think it's inspired, but we all know that things change. We look at that temple that was supposed to be built in the Tooele area. Isn't that right? Or, or Tuwila, in Utah? And, the and the neighbors yeah. said, no way. And these were LDS neighbors. And I think maybe they carry a little more weight and they just said, fine, we're taking it down the road. We don't want to mess with this. But I know the church likes to crunch numbers, even though they don't reveal numbers. They like to crunch numbers. They like to send out surveys. I wish they would look at all the temples that they built and they'd make two columns. And one says, you know, went off without a hitch, a breeze, welcomed by the neighborhood, right? And put all those temples in that column and then make another column where they say pushback, you know, people are upset, lawsuits, and then try to, I mean, we can tell them why. It's its because the ones in the other column are being built where it's zoned for and, and they're welcomed and there's no problem and, and try to arrive at it themselves. You know, what is What's the what's the common denominator here in this column where we're getting so much pushback? And it's the same thing. You just need to find an appropriate space for it. And that can be inspired too, because why do you want to destroy these communities? I mean, we talked to the people in Cody and it's like, I don't know if it's ever going to recover. And I think Heber is feeling that way too. And, and it's really, it's a tragedy. And now I look at um, Vegas and Lone Mountain, I feel it might be headed that same direction. Yeah, very, very likely. Um, they have a strong neighborhood group mm -hmm. uh, that's very dedicated to maintaining this rural neighborhood mm -hmm. and uh, wish them the best of luck. Yep, we do. And I know we'll be podcasting about it again because with these legal processes, it's slow. It's slow moving, but it's ongoing. And so we'll definitely bring you more news of Lone Mountain and Heber Valley and Cody. So uh, please leave us your comments. Are they building a temple in your town? <laughs> what do you think about this? And also the ongoing story in Cody and the ongoing story in Heber that we've been covering for. Has it been a year? I think it's almost been a year mm -hmm. since we've been covering all this. It's been a long time. Yeah, we, we'd love your input and your feedback and to know what you think. Uh, please like and subscribe to Mormonish. And if you would like to be made aware of when our new episodes come out, you can hit the notification bell. If you would like to financially support or donate to Mormonish Podcast, we always have links in our show notes to Venmo and to PayPal and to mormonishpodcast.org. And we certainly appreciate all of your support. We really could not bring you any of these broadcasts without everything that you do for us. And we do have a new link in the show notes, which we're really excited about. We have Mormonish merch. I know, I can't believe it. People have been asking us for it and we finally put it together. So I think you have a, a, you have a few things there, Landon. We have Mormonish mug now. Do you have yours yeah. right there, Landon? Um, Mine's yeah. pink. What mine. color is yours on the inside? Mine is black. Okay. Yours is black, very manly oh, mug. Yeah. That's right. So mugs, and I have a couple things. We kind of got a bag of swag the other day. And we're unpacking yes, we going, oh, look at all that. So like a, I got a water bottle. That was in my swag bag and that was yeah. fun. Um, 
Do you have a coffee mug? Awesome. Coffee I mug. Have a... uh, I've got, you know, there's some clothing you can get if you want to oh, support Mormonism. Well, you got one and, of the sweatshirts. Uh, well, I want some, one of those. Wear some swag. Okay. So I got a hat, which is awesome. I'll have to take my reading glasses off before I could wear it, but it's very cute. So, <laughs> anyway, if you're interested in any Mormonish merch, the link is there in the show notes and also, of course, on our Facebook page. So, all right. I think we've covered it, haven't we, Landon? And we do wish all of these citizens groups of the best. In the show notes, we will link information, I think probably to all of them, since we're talking about temples and, and it's good to raise awareness. So check out the show notes if you want more information, especially about um, Lone Mountain. If you'd like to know how to contact them and find out more or see how you could help or see how you could donate because they're at the very beginning of what they're going to be doing. So, all right. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for co-hosting Landon. And we will see you next time on Mormonish. Thank you. Thanks for joining us for another episode of Mormonish. We really appreciate our listeners and would love to hear from you if you have a story you'd like to share. You can email us at mormonishpodcast at gmail.com. You can also find us on Facebook, Instagram, and on our website, mormonishpodcast.org. And don't forget to look for us on YouTube and like and subscribe. Keep joyful, everybody.